Welcome to this five-part module on protozoal infections. This will be your first uh, component of the module, which will be a brief overview of protozoa and focus on protozoa that cause infection of the red blood cells. Subsequently, there will be a module on gastrointestinal protozoal infections, two sessions on central nervous system and tissue protozoal infections, and then we'll finish up with a section on travel medicine. My name is Brian Schwartz. I'm an infectious diseases doctor at University of California, San Francisco, and excited to talk about protozoal infections in that we see these in our patients on a regular basis uh, from a wide array of different hosts, both uh, those with normal and abnormal immune systems. The learning objectives for this uh, session is for you to be able to categorize protozoa by organ systems infected to contrast and compare plasmodium species, the species that cause malaria, with focusing on the life cycle stages important in human disease, recognize common clinical manifestations of malaria, understand how malaria is diagnosed in the laboratory setting, be able to list the key drugs used in the treatment and prophylaxis of malaria, describe some measures available for the prevention of malaria, and lastly, we want you to know the epidemiology, clinical manifestations, and diagnostic testing modalities for babesiosis. So this figure here shows a very broad overview of all the major human pathogens that cause disease. Now, when we talk about parasitic infection, uh, which you probably have all heard about the term parasitic infection, we're really talking about these, this grouping here of protozoa and helminths. Uh, protozoa tend to be single-celled organisms. Um, they will often have more than one life cycle stage, often will have a modal uh, trophozoite stage and a cyst stage later on that is non-modal. Uh, they can cause diseases in many areas, which we'll talk about. This is in contrast to the helminths. The helminths are multicellular organisms. Uh, we tend to think of them mostly as worms. Uh, they elicit an eosinophilic response. So there, as you probably know, there are multiple different types of white blood cells, and the ones uh, termed eosinophilias, eosinophils will often respond, will be elevated in patients who have helminth infections, which we don't tend to see in patients who have protozoa infections. So this module today will be focusing on the two main species of protozoa that cause infection in the blood, plasmodium, uh, which cause malaria, and babesia, which cause babesiosis. My colleague Peter Chin Hong will be talking about gastrointestinal and genitourinary protozoa. Uh, and then uh, Peter and then again myself will be talking about both t uh, protozoa that cause infections in different tissues, uh, also predominantly central nervous system infections too. So moving on to really focus on malaria. I think a lot of you probably heard a lot about malaria. Um, some of you who have traveled to malaria endemic regions may have been taking uh, preventative treatments uh, for malaria. So malaria is contracted by the bite of a Anopheles mosquito. Um, there are many different types of mosquitoes that cause infection. Uh, Anopheles mosquito is the one that uh, uh, transmit plasmodium infection. And plasmodium species are the ones that cause malaria. So there are four that are core uh, for you to learn about in terms of causes of malaria infection. Uh, and then there's one additional that I'll mention. So plasmodium falciparum is by far the most common and the one associated with the most severe disease. Um, it is the uh, one we'll discuss the most about. Plasmodium ovale and vivax, also common, and their unique characteristic that you want to remember about is they're the ones that can cause a latent infection in the liver, come out later. Uh, Plasmodium malariae does not have that latent phase um, and is, it tends to be less severe than Plasmodium falciparum. There's also the newer species called Plasmodium nolzii, uh, which was originally thought just to cause infection in monkeys, but is now uh, recently been recognized to cause infection in humans as well. So what is the extent of malaria infection uh, worldwide? Well, as you can see here, there are over 2 million cases 
of malaria infection per year, um, and they cause significant morbidity and mortality. I'm only mentioning the mortality here, but over 600 uh, 600,000 deaths per year, and most of these are in African children. So uh, you can see why there is a huge uh, national effort, uh, excuse me, global effort to uh, help control and eradicate malaria. Where are these infections happening? So they tend to occur in both tropical uh, and subtropical regions across the world, which you can see uh, pretty well here. Um, the area where we see overall the greatest burden of disease is sub-Saharan Africa, but there's also quite a bit of disease in the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, and then the Amazonia region of South America. Um, there is disease close to us uh, in the Caribbean, Central America, and some in Mexico as well. Now moving on to talk about the life cycle of plasmodium infection. So this is really interesting um, uh, life cycle, um, and we're going to spend a fair amount of time now uh, going over the details. So as I said uh, earlier on, the Anopheles mosquito is the one who transmits the infection. And what happens is the Anopheles mosquito injects sporozoites, and these sporozoites go to the liver. And that's kind of the first uh, phase of infection. Uh, once in the liver, it goes on to form a, a chazant. Uh, and over a one to two week period of time, uh, you're going to have the organisms in the liver. And then eventually, over time, it's going to spill out into the bloodstream. And that's how we get a lot of the clinical disease. Before we move on to talking about the blood phase, uh, as I mentioned before, I want to remind you that Plasmodium ovale and Plasmodium vivax do have a latent phase in the liver. And there, um, even once you've treated the blood phase of disease, it can the organisms can come out of the liver again and develop another round of uh, infection. So important thing to remember, and we'll mention again, we talk about treatment. So now back to the blood phase. So you have uh, infection in the liver, you have the merozoites uh, coming out of the liver into the blood and start infecting red blood cells. So the merozoite uh, tend to to uh, transform into trophozoites. And you can see here that trophozoite or that classic ringed trophozoite of Plasmodium falciparum. Uh, you see uh, then matures to the chazant phase and you have uh, numerous chazants uh, released and then they go and they infect more and rub more red blood cells and you get this circle uh, and exponential increase uh, in infection in red blood cells. And this is, uh, we'll talk next about pathophysiology, uh, why we have clinical disease. Most of the drugs that we use are active on the red blood cell phase, um, but there is one drug available for the treatment of the liver phase. One other thing to remember that these organisms do have a sexual reproductive uh, cycle as well. And in the blood, you can develop a gametocyte. Uh, these are often of Plasmodium falciparum, are these banana-shaped gametocytes. And they get picked up uh, by the bite of another Anopheles mosquito, uh, where the sexual reproductive phase uh, will take place. So, as I said, we'll talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of disease. So, why do people get sick with malaria? Well, these parasitized red blood cells um, are become abnormal red blood cells, sticky red blood cells, and they'll bind to the vascular endothelium inside blood vessels. And this process called cytoadherence happens. So, when you get binding of all these red blood cells uh, in the blood vessels, you get disruption of normal blood flow, and then you can get sequestration of these organisms in tissues, such as the brain, the kidney, the lung, um, and you can lead to cerebral malaria, central nervous system malaria, uh, placental malaria, like you can see in this image here. This is cytoadherence and sequestration uh, in the placenta. This ultimately leads to tissue hypoxia and lactic acidosis of these tissues. 
Now, plasmodium falciparum, as I said, it can be more severe, and the reason is is that uh, it tends to affect more red blood cells at different stages, so you get more uh, of this cytoadherence sequestration um, than you would with other species. Clinical manifestations. So most commonly when we see patients who come in with malaria, they tend to have what we call an undifferentiated febrile illness. They'll have fever, aches, maybe a headache, but they don't have other clear uh, abnormalities. They don't come in with abdominal pain. They don't usually come in with rash. But they can quickly progress to some of these other more severe manifestations, such as cerebral malaria. So we've seen patients become obtunded. They become confused. They have seizures. It can, you can have a high burden of organism in the kidneys, and you can develop renal failure. Often, if you have a lot of parasi uh, parasites in the red blood cells, you have continued lysis. You can have come in severely anemic. Pregnant women are at risk for placental malaria. Those who have more chronic infection, as these organisms get picked up by the spleen, you can get splenomegaly. There is a subset of patients who may be asymptomatic with malaria, and these tend to be uh, folks who are from endemic regions, probably had long-standing infection, and your body will able to develop some degree of immunity, but not complete, and you can be relatively asymptomatic. Um, with malaria on, in certain populations. Um, but as I said, complete immunity is really not ever achieved, um, but that you can get this partial immunity. Uh, people who tend to have most severe disease, and as I mentioned, it was African children, for example, that have the most deaths because they tend to be newly exposed, they don't have any immunity, um, and they tend to be at high risk for, more, for very severe disease. Also, uh, travelers, so people who are from non-endemic regions and then go on to develop malaria can have very severe malaria because they have, not, they have no immunity at all. Um, over time, uh, evolution has uh, helped uh, to combat uh, malaria to some degree. Um, certain genetic uh, um, mutations have led to things like sickle cell anemia, uh, G6PD deficiency, thalassemia, hemoglobin C, uh, and uh, loss of the Duffy blood group antigen, which all have different levels of uh, protection against uh, plasmodium infection. And obviously, they tend to be more common in regions where there is still high uh, rates of malaria. How do you make the diagnosis of malaria? So there's two ways that we tend to make the diagnosis, um, which is uh, direct uh, identification of the organisms. And here at, um, at our hospital at UCSF, uh, this is what we do. Um, we'll do both a thick smear and a thin smear. The thick smear you, looks at a large amount of red blood cells and looks for some organisms. Here you can see, um, I know it's small, but these are uh, ringed trophozoites. Uh, and then you can actually see a big banana gametocyte, and this is Plasmodium falciparum. It's more sensitive than the sick thin smear where you're looking at a more high power field, but it does allow, the thin smear does do a better job of allowing you to make identifications based on species, and that does that is helpful uh, in terms of determining treatment uh, later on. There is antigen testing available where um, microscopy is not reliable um, and it is used uh, in some parts of the world. So on to treatment about malaria. So most treatment is active against the blood phase, and that's where a lot of the disease is going on. Uh, a lot of the drugs that we use include chloroquine, mefloquine, quinine, the artemisinins, and etovacone proguanol. I'll talk for a minute about the artemisinins because those have really come out on several studies to be the most effective uh, drug uh, in terms of plasmodium falciparum infection, both in adults and children. Very effective. Uh, and they were actually found uh, are derived from the wormwood tree, which was originally, uh, this was originally discovered in China. Um, but it was hard to make a large amount of the drug uh, from the tree. And ultimately, scientists were able to engineer yeast, uh, as you can see in this image here, uh, to uh, make the artemisinin. And this has allowed for a less expensive and uh, larger supply of the medication.
One more time, I'll remind you that the latent phase of Plasmodium vivax in ovale requires a separate treatment, which is Primaquin. Uh, Primaquin uh, cannot be given to, to patients who have G6PD deficiency, uh, which we did just talk about, and you need to do testing ahead of time so you won't give it to someone with G6PD deficiency and have them develop severe hemolysis. Malaria prevention. Uh, there's two strategies for control. So on a global, uh, larger scale sense, things that are used in the communities are bed nets uh, that tend to be insecticide treated, as you can see uh, in this picture of the young boy here um, who is under a permethrin treated insect uh, bed net. Also doing in indoor spraying of insecticides has been shown to be effective. On an individual level, a lot of people will uh, use insect repellents like DEET on their skin or permethrin on their clothing, but kind of the mainstay in the U.S. Uh, if you're going to a malaria endemic region is chemoprophylaxis. Uh, you may have uh, taken uh, medications like mefloquine, uh, atovacone, proguanol, doxycycline. These are some of them that are commonly given for prophylaxis to prevent malaria infection. It's important to remember that because there is that liver phase for most of these drugs, uh, if you were to get infected the day before you left, your malaria species uh, is going to be in your liver for up to two weeks. So if you're stopped taking a medication that's only active against the blood phase at that time, um, it's going to come out later into your uh, blood and you're not going to have any effective drug available. So uh, that's why most of these chemoprophylactic agents, to play it safe, are given for about four weeks uh, after leaving uh, so that if there are organisms still in the liver and they have not come out into the bloodstream yet, uh, that you're uh, able to kill them when they do. The last organism we're going to talk about uh, is uh, Babesia or Babesiosis infection, uh, opposed to malaria, which is transmitted by a mosquito. This is a uh, tick uh, derived, the, mostly the Ixodes ticks, and you can see in this image how easy uh, it is to be infected by a tick and not know it given how small they are. Um, Babesia microti is the most common uh, species to cause infection in the U.S., and predominantly it's in New England and the Midwest during the summers. Uh, there are less than 1,000 cases per year, and risk factors for severe disease are really those who are immunocompromised and have had a splenectomy. Diagnosis, like malaria, is often made by finding the organism under the blood smear. And uh, if for those who are not thinking about it, sometimes they'll be mistaken for malaria. Um, you can see here this uh, classic Maltese cross um, intracellular arrangement is quite classic for babesiosis. There's also serological testing, like antibody testing or PCR testing, which is available. Clinical manifestations, and a lot of people will be asymptomatic, but when they're symptomatic, people can have, be, have fever, uh, also severe anemia, and it can progress even uh, to, to septic shock, um, multi-organ system failure in uh, immunocompromised patients. Treatment tends to be quinine uh, plus clindamycin, uh, and prevention is with tick avoidance with DEET, permethrin, et cetera. Uh, I'll leave you on this last slide here for a review of comparison between malaria and babesiosis, um, looking at the differences between pathogens, vectors, clinical manifestations, diagnosis, and prevention. Uh, the next uh, slide set in this series is going to be about uh, gastrointestinal infections with protozoa. Thank you.